uh, saw each other, uh, and we have to try to understand uh, what kept us apart for so long, and whether this is it. Uh, I want to go back, though, at first to some of the uh, thinking or research that I've been doing about how the war ended. I think it was uh, one of the reasons for our exhaustion and going our separate ways at the end of the Vietnam War uh, was because we were, we were very divided in our perception. On a narrow level, McCarthy people did not like Kennedy people. On a broader level, uh, there were differences in the perception of reality along racial lines, gender lines, class lines. Some of them are embedded in our society itself. Some of them embedded in us because of, we haven't found ways to shed them. And those antagonisms made it possible to unify on a mobilization or a specific moment in time, but made it impossible for us to stay unified in a divided society. Uh, there was no blessed community within an ext extremely unblessed uh, society and divided society. Uh, and it was also uh, uh, matters of fate that we never considered when it began. That, um, we thought we could determine our own destiny through rational decision-making, when in fact uh, we lived on uh, like small boats floating on a sea with raging tides under us, raging cross-currents that we could not control, uh, only had the illusion of control or occasional control. Uh, and when the tide went out, movement ended and we looked around at each other. Some were burned out, some said, what's next? We never looked back. Um, and if we tried to look back, we, we were conflicted because we felt pains and uh, antagonisms towards each other or misunderstandings that didn't really compel us to uh, return again. I went to, I, I learned this very well when I went to the uh, SNCC 50th reunion a few years ago at Shaw, and there were a comparable number of people, thousand people or so there, for, and it was their first effort. It was well organized, and I saw in the audience people sitting alongside each other who were really serious opponents of each other, personally, ideologically, strategically, um, and in front of them was Eric Holder, Attorney General of the United States, saying if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be on the seventh floor as the Attorney General of this country. And I could tell in the audience, there were a lot of people who wanted to stand and say whatever was on their mind, but they held their discipline in an unusual, unusual way, uh, because they had a mutual desire to share in the credit because they were being written into history by a high U.S. official who was bringing credit uh, and, and, and congratulations from the President of the United States uh, who might have been there. Maybe that was debated and rejected. I have no idea what happened. I wasn't in the, uh, the planning committee for that one. But if you look at the city, you'll see uh, another example of what I mean is that every social movement gets a monument or a memorial, right? We're going to the King Monument, but, but if you look at the AFL-CIO, or, or you look at the Feminist Majority, or you look at the um, immigrant rights hist histories, you'll find across the country that we have a, what Mike Davis once called a loric L-O-R-I-C, Loric Landscape. We've transformed our landscape into a place of names and monuments and parks uh, and that are in recognition 
of the martyrs and movements that came before in the most unusual places. Why would Birmingham, Alabama have its entire downtown remade uh, to mark the history of the civil rights movement? Uh, the, the battle isn't even over, but that was achieved. Um, Greensboro, North Carolina took years to debate about what to do with the lunch counter uh, and uh, the, 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 the corner where the sit-ins began with the four students. Eventually, it became a vote of the of the public whether to honor it or not. And the winning argument, I believe, um, Mr. Bond or other historians here could correct me, I believe the final argument was there would be money in it. Charlie Cobb wrote a book about the economics of civil rights tourism. Well, you can, it's true, you can take a civil rights tour of the Confederacy, and if you don't go outside the path, you're pretty safe ground bringing your children. It, it, it did happen. Um, I don't expect that the peace movement will ever be remembered that way, but it strikes me as stunning that there's no recognition. Um, I remember a few years ago we tried to have a memorial for what happened in Chicago in 68. And um, we got the, the mayor interested. Um, we got a, 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 an architect in Chicago, a design sculpture, who wanted to put up a peace plaque uh, in, in Grant Park. Uh, in, I think it was in memory of the people who came here in 1968 to opposed the Vietnam War. Well, the police department went berserk. They issued t-shirts that said, and I wore one, I have one, that said, we kicked your father's ass in 68 and we'll kick yours too. So, the, 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 mayor, the mayor quickly retreated from any consideration of any small peace memorial garden or plaque in Lincoln Park. And so it stands. And since then, I've always been aware that there's an effort to punish us in retrospect by eliminating us from, from history. And that's a very important uh, uh, problem to uh, correct, I think. Um, what happened at the end, since leaders like King and Kennedy were murdered, is that the support for the war uh, crumbled, and I borrowed from W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, analysis of the uh, slave system and Reconstruction, where he described the slaves as uh, undertaking a general strike of their sorts by walking away from the plantation economy when they judged that it was possible um, and they could make their way first into the circuits of the Underground Railroad uh, and then uh, into the ranks of the Union Army. And the plantation economy completely collapsed. Uh, and the parallel would be when the, the Vietnamese peasantry walked away from the French plantations. That would be the beginning. But not so long after, a very short time after 1965, students were walking away from universities, um, uh, soldiers were walking away from their duties, um, communities of color had already chosen better wars to fight at home, voters were walking away from conventional politics, the underground press was walking away from the mainstream media, and the counterculture was withdrawing from all of it. That might have been different if our leaders had not been killed, uh, but that was the way the war ended. I think, in retrospect, there's a common misunderstanding that I, that I saw uh, overcome today. The original understanding was there was people that worked outside the system and inside, people who were radical and people who were uh, progressive or moderate. Um, and they were in these warring camps, these different camps. Um, in retrospect, it does seem to me that um, uh, what happened is that the more extreme or radical-led tendencies, um, despite the very, very sharp and quarrelsome differences, 
helped lead to a vast expansion of anti-war sentiment uh, among the, uh, the mainstream. Both uh, Bobby Kennedy and Gene McCarthy, for example, spoke of their campaigns for the presidency, uh, among other reasons, as being alternatives, constructive alternatives within the system to what they considered and described as irregular or radical movements outside the system. In other words, they ran to open the system to us on the outside, in part. We thought, of course, well, that was a sinister plot to co-opt us and rejected it. Another way to look at it in hindsight is that it was our energy and our challenge and our radicalism that made a, a, a plausible path to withdrawal from Vietnam a political uh, reality. I think uh, that's a better uh, view. The moratorium was even conceived as an acceptable alternative to the mobilization and so on. Well, what, what did we think? Did we think that we could swing a majority of Americans uh, to a Marxist analysis or, or revolution because of the draft? And did we think that the Vietnamese could wait for us to do that before ending the war? Uh, come on. We, we have to begin to e evaluate what happened uh, as clearly as we can. I think we, we can take credit, uh, if credit is sought, for the constituencies and opportunities that brought about Ron Dellums, Bella Abzug, Ash Schroeder, Gene McCarthy, Bobby Kennedy, George McGovern, and the list goes on. They all came to office by 72 at the height of the radicalism and polarization in society. So the lesson for me is that somehow, not that the system works, but that there is a path from the margin to the mainstream, from the outside to the inside. The radicals initiate the process of social change based on the memory of past achievements, and then they finally enter the mainstream and win at least a partial victory. The other side retains a very large block of voters, as large as 49%, 45%, not a small tendency, uh, and they have institutional staying power and secret staying power through agencies like the police, the FBI. They fight a defensive counter movement forever against the movement's gains. I remember back in the day we thought that they would go away because their ideas were obsolete. Wrong. Zombies! <laughs> they, they, they would adopt a zombie uh, uh, reality, perhaps. But no, they, when they feel the loss of power, they fight harder. When we succeed in gaining power, we fragment or relax. That seems to be uh, in the DNA of politics, if not our personalities. Uh, but now we're on this battlefield of memory and we're fighting over legacy. Uh, and uh, movements need to fight for legacy. Counter movements fight on behalf of forgetting anything. And the uh, center, meaning the academic historians and the politicians, try to co-opt the story into the national narrative showing what a great country we are. Uh, they don't know how to co-opt us, in this case, because it's so painful and difficult to digest a moral and military defeat that cost 58,000 American lives and three to six million lives in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. How do you look the voters in the eye and say, mistake, it's impossible. You escalate, you become more uh, defensive. So we have to resurrect ourselves somehow from the oblivion that they have already prepared for us. I believe it's reasonable to think that we can go from being a distorted footnote uh, in history to become a factor complicating their work, their war making, on the path to becoming the force that we should be in American politics and history. I have a very practical mind, uh, as some of you 
may, may, that may be debatable. We'll put that to a workshop. <laughs> but I would like to offer some achievable uh, lessons. One is, uh, several of us had a meeting with the Pentagon. It was my first meeting, and, and it was very striking. We looked through the windows of the building, and all we saw were gravestones of unknown soldiers at Fort Myers. That's all there was in the background for our meeting. And here we were. And to our surprise, because the New York Times had covered this uh, uh, narrative of the Pentagon, they, um, they said that they wanted to drop the, uh, the plans for curriculum and educational materials and teaching their version of what happened in Vietnam. Uh, that they really wanted to go back to honoring the uh, veterans for their sacrifice. There were nine million, now, now it was seven million, and they were going every day. And, and they said they were surprised when we said, it was Marge who said, well, that's a great idea. We, we want to honor the veterans for their service as well. We just don't want you to occupy uh, our field of history and take it away from us or distort it. Uh, and so we achieved a kind of truce by accident that they would no longer invade and occupy our space, the history of the anti-war movement, and we had no particular interest in, in, in getting into entanglements or arguments against veterans who'd gone through enough hell. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we've moved forward, but it, it will require um, years to carry this out because administrations will change, secretaries will change. Um, this remains uh, in, in a, uh, a state of um, uh, suspense, but we'd like to go forward, the planning committee would go forward to continue arguing and dialoguing with the Pentagon and keep them out of the history of the anti-war movement and get the anti-war movement incorporated somewhere in the history near the memorial, which is a, a Vietnam memorial exhibition that was started by Jan Scrubs and has gone through uh, many variations because they are going to cover something about the anti-war movement in that memorial. And they have a lot of money and they have staying power. And they're gonna, they said they were gonna put a Bob Dylan song, yeah, that's, that's a start. Uh, and we, we need to be fully uh, prepared to return to the talking table to see what they're doing, and we'd like to be able to report to you on a continuous basis about whether anything good is happening, or it's all bad, or something in between, to get su some kind of feedback. Um, I think also, um, uh, we have models. I mentioned the uh, Chicano Moratorium this morning in L.A. It's a quandary for me um, uh, that four were killed there, four were killed at Kent State, but the, the attention to the two is shockingly uh, 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 contradictory. But we have the, um, at Kent State, you know, a very nice uh, decade-long struggle has resulted in an exhibition that's important. Um, at, at Berkeley, which purged the uh, free speech movement, uh, they now have the Free Speech Cafe, which is a beautiful site on sprawl steps where the entire panoramic history of the free speech movement that was just before Vietnam uh, is on display for any uh, undergraduates who may, may want to look up from their computers to see what's on the wall behind them. Um, and that's because Berkeley has found, believe it or not, that it's a good brand to be a university that fostered the free speech movement. Oh my God, but it's true. Things like that can happen to us because we have more influence on our culture than we realize. So we'd like to do more of that. Uh, David Courtright's peace study uh, uh, program at Notre Dame. Notre Dame, that's where the Vietnam War started, isn't it, theologically? Has hired this 
he's, he's saying he, he's already been slightly co-opted. No, it's a, he, he's a wonderful example of a peace studies program that is just extraordinary. And I believe that representatives of five other peace studies programs uh, have come here to this uh, occasion. Uh, we, we, we already have a relationship with the Howard Zinn Educational Project to teach the lessons of Vietnam, and we need to find better ways. Carol Kurtz just pointed out that her son is a teacher, and he says, the materials are there, but the teachers aren't trained. Well, we can take that on, certainly. Um, and uh, on a more deep level, I think, uh, very quickly, we really need to encourage people to go into journalism in the tradition of uh, Cy Hirsch, who is an alternative reporter when he discovered the, uh, the story of My Lai. We really need to uh, support more whistleblowers in the tradition of Dan Ellsberg, and there are many among us. We really need to uh, uh, support, the, support the legislative outcome of all of our work, which is the Congressional Progressive Caucus that you heard from Barbara Lee about. Every one of us in our districts can ask a member of Congress to sign up for the Progressive Caucus. In close races, all of it, all of us can make a difference in how they vote on funding these future wars and whether they'll join that caucus. Um, we need to be a peace presence in every swing district in the United States. And we need to, to do that to be significant. We need to build alliances with communities of color, labor, and environmentalists not only because it's morally right, but because it's the only way to build a mass movement. It's the only way. Uh, the road to peace runs through justice in Baltimore. You know that. How, how do you do that? How do you implement that? You have to narrow the racial gap that affects the movement. Uh, other achievements have to be protected. We've got these wars going on. We achieved the War Powers Act, and now they're trying to do everything to circumvent and avoid. It's not even strong enough. The, the radicals, I don't know where I was in this debate, thought that it was a step back from the constitutional empowerment of Congress to even have the War Powers Act. Uh, no president has respected it because they think it interferes with their executive power. The truth is in between. But the fact is, there's no authorization for these wars that are spreading everywhere, and Congress is unable to grapple with the issue. And I agree with Barbara Lee. They have to force a vote. If we lose the vote, so be it. Take the names who voted no and remind them Remind them what happened to the people that voted for the authorization in Iraq. Yeah. There are um, another achievement. We actually got some controls or oversight over the uh, CIA and the FBI in 1975. We achieved the uh, Congressional Oversight Committees. Power grows old. Power hits middle age. Power decays. Oversight is meaningless today, as far as I can tell, except the staff of Dianne Feinstein did a hell of a job producing that report with all the redactions, but it shed light on the current torture programs of the uh, agency, and we need to tighten the controls and go at the question again. Even some Republicans are getting a little nervous about Big Brother spying on everyone. Um, and, and so the fight for continual congressional oversight and disclosure um, uh, uh, and, and use of the Freedom of Information Act is very important to the spread of the, the democracy movement, which is all this is all about. There are really deep questions that I'm not uh, able to uh, uh, answer, and I could tell from the discussions they were on the minds of many people that we need to all undertake for the rest of our lives. Vivian Rothstein uh, asked me to ask, why, why did we do this? What? We were 20. Why did this happen? And you know, I said, 
Good question. Um, Stoughton Lynn said it as a historian once when I was with him. Uh, he told somebody in Vietnam that we devoted our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to ending the war. We devoted the productive years of our lives when we should have been getting ahead to getting out. We took it as our mission to live fulfilling lives instead of making money and getting into the career ladder. And that hurt us. We didn't seem to care. I was reminded of that by uh, David Harris today, talking about the way Stanford student body president, and by the way, Rosalio Munoz, a UCLA student body president, used their presidency to announce that they were going to refuse the draft. That's an amazing act for putting oneself at risk. And why we did that um, is a question that we have to really understand and explain to our country. Um, I think it had to do with wanting to be lifetime organizers because we found it more meaningful. It was at a time when, of course, college didn't cost that much money. So you could go to Mississippi for a year and come back and use that as a credential to get back into university. But it was more, it was more than that. It was some people chose to um, want to spend their lives exploring the deeper meaning of being alive in the first place. And that's a saving remnant for any civilization. The other deep question is why we lost our way, having found our way. And I don't know the answer to that. But we said we were not going to be like the old left, but we became like the old left. We fell into the same sectarian divisions. We duplicated in our movements the very racial, gender, and class divisions that we said we were rejecting in the world outside. And if we cannot answer those questions, we must not give up trying. So let this conference be a step, a turning point in our reawakening. Thank you, and let's march.